an FBI agent would end up turning in his own son for a double murder. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Grant Hendrickson and Michelle Cartagena. Viewer discretion is advised. <laughs> Michelle Cartagena was born on May 2nd, 1975, and she was actually born in Monterey, California, but this case occurred in Georgia. She actually went to high school in the Columbus, Georgia area, specifically at Spencer High School. She graduated as the valedictorian of that year. She was a member of the school marching band. She played singles tennis in school, and she was the captain of the school's softball team. She was also a member of the National Honor Society, and she eventually got a scholarship to attend Mercer University in the Macon, Georgia area. Michelle was someone who uh, always wanted to help others, and she would volunteer her free time whenever she could to volunteer at the local Humane Society. She also volunteered at the Red Cross. Everyone described her as this incredibly gifted, very talented young woman who whose aspirations were to be something involving helping others. And that was something she probably was going to do. And her plan was to end up majoring in physical therapy or something in the medical field. Also attending Mercer University was Patrick Grant Hendrickson. He would go by grants to everyone. He was born on September 20th, 1972, and his entire life was spent um, in the Macon, Georgia area. Grant was a fantastic musician. He loved playing music. He was part of a band. He was also part of the Macon Theater Group. Everyone referred to him as a very uh, gentle person. He was just so kind to people. And he and Michelle were like this perfect duo. They really worked well together. Grant was also um, heavily into sports. He played soccer. He played baseball. He was also on the church softball team. He enjoyed being outdoors. He loved to go hunting. He loved fishing. He loved camping. He was a big hiker. He was pursuing his career in electrical engineering. And he was at Mercer University on a, an academic scholarship as well. And just like uh, Michelle, uh, he also volunteered his free time to help others and to help in the community. He also loved to volunteer at the Museum of Arts and Sciences. He was just a super, super intelligent guy. Michelle and Grant did not have any enemies. They were so well liked in the, in the community. They had a nice large group of friends and they got along really well with each other, but they also as a duo got along with everyone, which is why when this thing happened, everyone was just blown away. It was the night of January 2nd, 1995 near Macon, Georgia. Grant and Michelle would drive out to Lake Juliet, and specifically they would go to an area that they refer to as The Point. It sounds like it was probably one of those like make out point type things. They parked their car there and they were probably just, you know, having a romantic evening, probably just talking, laughing, having a good time. Something that they were, you know, a private thing they were doing there. It was around midnight when other people who were kind of in that general area they suddenly heard the sound of gunshots. There was a little bit of silence and then more gunshots. But the witnesses who heard these things didn't really think anything of it. I mean, you know, people will shoot kind of randomly, you know? And it wouldn't be until the, until the following morning when everyone realized what those gunshots were. Because at the point at Lake Juliet, a couple of people would come across this white car and a very bloody scene. 22-year-old Grant Hendrickson was dead in the driver's seat of the car. It was his car. Michelle Cartagena was found about 30-ish feet away from the car, and she was shot to death. It looked like someone had dragged her out of the passenger seat because there were drag marks and dragged her to the location where she was found. The belief is that whoever did this may have planned to sexually assault her, but they, there was no evidence that this person actually did it. However, they did find a big wad of spit on, I think it was on her leg area. 
it was spit kind of mixed up with some like tobacco. So like someone had smoked a cigarette and then spit on her. So it was determined that two guns were used in this attack. First, an AR-15 was used and the bullets were fired from about 40 feet away. They found, you know, a whole bunch of spent casings in like a pile kind of. And then whoever did this moved pr pretty much at point blank range to where Grant was in the driver's seat and shot him five more times with a nine millimeter handgun, including a shot directly to Grant's head. Police interviewed people who would come forward to state that, hey, we heard gunshots the night prior. We didn't think anything of it, um, but so they reported that. And then this would spawn other witnesses to come forward to state that they were driving in the area of the lake when these murders would have happened. And they saw a 1980s late model like Honda CRX, like a dark colored one parked near the entrance of the lake area. A couple different people would state that they saw the same Honda CRX either at the same location the other witnesses saw or somewhere closer to where the murders happened. And again, this was all around the midnight time frame when these murders would have occurred. They know the time frame because the witnesses who heard the gunshots looked at the clock in their car and noticed, you know, it was about midnight. The problem that police had from the get-go was they had no idea who did this. And they had no idea the motive. There wasn't anything stolen from the vehicle. Michelle was not sexually assaulted. So what was the reasoning here? Why did this happen? They interviewed people from their school. They interviewed people they worked with. They interviewed friends, family, and nobody could give police any inkling as to who either of them may have known that would have done this. They had no enemies. There were no jealous or jilted exes. They had not gotten into any recent arguments with people. They didn't have any run-ins with the wrong person. There was nothing. And they had, so police were like, well, what the hell? Who knew they were gonna be there in this remote location to do this and why? The investigation lasts for about two years or so. So really the only things they could do were look up the purchases of any type of similar guns that were made in that time frame, and also they had the spit. They created a DNA profile from the spit, but it did not match anyone that was in their database at that time. So what the agents did there, the detectives, was they began to look into purchases of AR-15s between the years of 1985 and 1995. And they looked up the purchases from every gun store in the area of Macon and the surrounding areas. It was a lot of work. I mean, this was a lot of extensive lists they got. They had to cross check people and all that. So they had a gigantic list of people and they kind of used that list to see if any of the people also owned a Honda CRX, just to kind of maybe, you know, make this list a little shorter. So when they began to question and interview all of these people. Most of them, if not all of them, were very willing to provide their own saliva to test against the spit that was found at the crime scene. And one by one, they were all cleared. It wasn't their spit. Their guns did not match the ammunition or the, you know, the, the casings or the bullets found with the bodies. So all of them were cleared. But there was one name on the list that they were still having issues with. Uh, a man named Andy Cook, who did not know Michelle or Grant. He had never met them before. They had never spoken to him. There was never any interaction with him. He had no connections to anyone in their lives. So by all accounts, this Andy Cook person was a completely random person who did this to these two people. They found out that he was on the list of purchasing an AR-15. When he is talking to police, he said he got rid of that AR-15. He said he got rid of it in April of 1994, but police knew right away that that wasn't true because he didn't actually purchase that AR-15 until August of 1994. So it was a complete and utter lie. So when they're pressing him, Andy Cook becomes extremely agitated. He becomes irritated and mad, and he blurts out, my dad works for the FBI, and he is not going to have this. He was almost bragging about his dad being an FBI agent, which his dad was, almost as a way of like, you can't do anything to me because my dad works for the FBI. Police were like, will you provide your saliva sample? And he says, well, I gotta talk to my FBI dad first before I do that. So then they look further into the AR-15. They found out that Andy Cook had actually pawned his AR-15 in May of 1995. They also discovered through interviews that Andy Cook had a friend who purchased Andy a nine millimeter handgun. 
And that happened about a month before the murder. Then they were looking into what kind of cars was Andy driving during the time these murders occurred. Well, he was driving in 1987 Honda CRX. Through interviewing some of Andy Cook's friends, they found out that Andy Cook had said, what's the worst thing you've ever done? The Andy asked his friend that. And then Andy would respond with his answer, and he said, well, one time I killed people with an AR-15. The friend was very skeptical when Andy said this, but he said, okay, well, why did you do it? And he said, I just wanted to see if I can get away with it. So police are trying to get back into contact with Andy Cook now, and so they go to his home. But when they go there, Andy is not home. However, Andy's father, John Cook, is home. John Cook is a confirmed FBI agent. He had been with the FBI for almost 30 years at that point. John Cook said, I will cooperate with you guys in any way. I'll help you try to find my son. He said, I don't think he would have done something like this, but I will do my best to find out where you know he is right now and get him back to you guys. So it took several hours, but John Cook was able to page his son and then his son responded and came back home. John told Andy, hey, the GBI is looking for you. You know, do you know what that's about? And he responded basically with, Daddy, I can't tell you anything because you're one of them. You're a cop. But John said, I'm your father first and foremost. I'm not a cop to you. I'm your dad. But that prompted John to ask his son, were you there when this, these shootings happened? Were you a witness to it? And Andy said, yes. And when he answered that way, John was like, okay, my son was there and he witnessed whoever did this. But then he got his his wheels turning and he began to think, I don't think my son's telling the truth. And so he asked him point blank, Andy, did you kill those two people? Andy then pauses for a few moments and says simply, yes. So what he then goes into his explanation, he says he was fishing at Lake Juliet and he saw the victims, you know, pull up and something happened where he got an argument with the, the male of the two people and that this male, whose name he didn't know, which would have been Grant, said, uh, he said that Grant pulled out a gun and said he was threatening to shoot him. But first and foremost, Grant, there was no gun in the car. Grant didn't have a gun with him. He took out his gun, his AR-15, and fired, you know, a whole bunch of rounds into the car. In self-defense, he said. The problem being is that they know for a fact the bullets were fired from about 40 feet away. And so John says, you need to go to police. You've got to tell them this. And Andy says... I'm just gonna run. I'm gonna make myself disappear. That prompted his dad to think, and he's gonna, he's gonna end his own life. So John relays everything to his wife, Andy's mom, and then he speaks to his supervisor at the FBI and says, you know, I know what the right thing to do is here, but I need to know what you want, what I, what I actually have to do. So on December 5th, 1996, John Cook does the right thing. He goes to the sheriff's office, he reports everything his son told him, and he said, my son confessed to killing Grant and Michelle. On December 5th, 1996, at around 11.45 a.m., Andy Cook just so happens to be arrested for something completely different. He had shot um, a deer and turkey when it wasn't seasoned for that, which is, you know, like they're not allowed, to, you know, allowed to do that. He gave those police a false name, but it would then come to be, be found out that this was Andy Cook, and they, you know, the people in Macon found out, and they went to that jail where Andy was. So they begin to question him about the double homicide, and he's like, starts, he yells back, like, you guys don't have anything. It's been two years. He says out loud, I, yeah, I had a CRX. Yeah, I had an AR-15. Yeah, I had a 9mm. And all you guys are going to do is you're going to try to frame me. And he then yells at them, go get my father. He's from the FBI, and I want a lawyer. So at that point, John Cook gets to the station where Andy is, the police station, and he says, can I please talk to my son privately? And they agree to let him do that. So John speaks to his son and he now tells him, Andy, I don't believe your story. Based on the evidence, I don't believe this was self-defense. You didn't know who they were, what happened? He said, the guy did not have a gun. I did not get into an argument with him. He said he simply just pulled into the same area as Grant and Michelle. And he just, out of complete randomness, took out his AR-15 from about 40 feet and fired into the car. Then he says he walks up to Grant in the driver's seat, who'd already been shot, and fires more rounds into him, including his head. He says he dragged Michelle out of the car, 
to make and pulled up her like skirts and everything and spit on her to make it look like this was an attempted sexual assault and a robbery gone wrong. And also this whole time, police have been trying to track down the AR-15 and the 9mm that he had already, you know, pawned off and sold, which had been then purchased by other people. They finally found both guns and they tested them and they confirmed that both of those weapons were confirmed to be the murder weapons. And at that point, they were able to then collect a DNA sample from Andy Cook. And back in the you know mid-90s, the DNA technology wasn't as extensive as it is now. But they did find out that Andy's DNA was a 1 in 20,000 match with, within the Caucasian community that would have that exact same DNA profile. Meaning it was pretty much his DNA. So Andy Cook was charged with two counts of felony murder and malice murder. They had his confession, they had his DNA, they had his murder, the guns he used to kill them were confirmed to be his. They were a match to the bullets found in the bodies and at the crime scene. And his own father, John Cook, got on the stand and testified against his own son and relayed the confession that Andy gave him. And it was obviously extremely difficult for him to do because he is his father, but Andy was also a murderer. And so, it really kind of brings into question, you know, those of you who are parents, would you do the same? I'm not a parent, so I can't, I can only say like what I think I would do. And I would think I would be, that I would do the right thing, but I'm not a parent, so I can't say that for sure. The testimony, the witnesses, the evidence, all of it was extremely damning. There was no doubt that Andy Cook was responsible for these murders. It was a completely random chance encounter, a random murder. He did not know them. They did not know him. They had never met, never crossed paths, never spoke. But he had no connection to anyone in their lives. This was random. They were literally in the wrong place at the wrong time. He was found guilty on all charges. He was sentenced to life in prison without parole for the murder of Grant. But for the murder of Michelle, he was also convicted and sentenced to death. On February 22nd, 2013, Andy Cook was strapped to the table and he was going to be executed by lethal injection. His final words were, I'm sorry, I'm not going to ask you to forgive me because I can't even do it to myself. And that's all he said. They then proceeded with the execution and he was pronounced dead a few moments later. All by this random circumstance. You know, if Michelle and Grant had gone somewhere just a little bit different, had they gotten there 10, 20 minutes later, maybe this never happens. You don't know. Um, and that's the unfortunate thing with these random things is that could they have ever been prevented? Could they have not happened? Sure. But it really does also make you look at society and people as a whole. Like there are people, and this isn't just Andy Cook. I mean, we've had mass shootings all over the place that aren't spurned by any kind of motive other than I want to create havoc. I want to, I want to kill people. And that's it. People like this exist right now to this day. It's going to happen again. It's going to continue happening. And there's really not much we can do about it. But with his confessions, with the evidence, and then with his execution, Grant Hendrickson and Michelle Cartagena did finally get the justice they both very rightfully deserved. But that is it for this case, True Crime, Aruni, Dooney, Dingleberry Dongs. I hope you found it interesting. As usual, if you are new here, hello, my name is Mike. I tell true crime stories on here, obviously. Um, so please subscribe, give this video a like if you're into that kind of thing. I also tell short form true crime stories over on TikTok. The link to my TikTok is in the link tree, which is in the description of this video below. You'll also find my case list, which has 6,500 plus names on it. It's alphabetical, scroll through it if you like. Um, and if there's a case you want me to cover that you don't see on that list, just send me a really quick email. Just email me the name of the case, where it happened and when it happened. I'll make sure to add that case to my list. I pick my cases I cover each time at random, so I cannot promise you when I'll cover that case, but I will get to it eventually. But that is it for this video, true crime, bless you. <laughs> that is it for this case, true crime, Maroonies. So until the next case, ta-ta for now.